got? I've got 4611. 4611. Yeah. Hi, and welcome to Home Time. I'm Joanne Liebler, and uh, that's Dean Johnson. And what we have here is a very large backyard, so it's kind of a long way to drag the hose whenever you have to water the grass. We're doing to this house what a lot of people are doing to theirs, installing an automatic underground sprinkler system. This is a good do-it-yourself project because it's easy to understand the design and installation principles. And it doesn't require a lot of specialized tools or equipment. And you can save up to half the cost of the job by doing it yourself. On this tape, we'll be working on two automatic sprinkler installations. One where we use PVC pipe, which is common in many areas, and one where we use polyethylene pipe, which is also a popular material. We'll get started right after this. Home Time is made possible by Chevy Full Size Pickup, the most dependable, longest lasting full size pickup on the road. At Home Time, we believe the best way to get the job done is to use the finest tools. And the Chevy Silverado is one of our favorites. Equipped with an optional Vortex 6000 V8 engine, it generates 300 horsepower and 355 foot-pounds of torque to power you through the toughest jobs. And with an available fourth door, you've got lots of room for all your other tools. And friends to help you use them. At home or on the job site. For work or play. It's no wonder we at Home Time count on Silverado, the truck, to get the job done. Silverado, from Chevy, the most dependable, longest lasting trucks on the road. When you start designing an underground sprinkler system, there's a couple of things you have to know about your house. An important one is the water flow rate. Okay, you ready? Yep. All right, go ahead. The flow rate is how many gallons per minute the house water system can supply. We've got a pretty foolproof method for checking this. We've got a two-gallon bucket, and we're timing how long it takes to fill up. Okay, right there. Got it. Ten seconds. Now, when you do this, you want to make sure the faucet's on all the way, and there isn't any water running in the house. Okay, ten seconds to fill up two gallons, so that would be 12 gallons in a minute. And that's our flow right here. Okay, now that's one way to do it. If you have access to this sort of tool, here's another way of getting that same number. This is a flow meter. You just turn on the water, let the water flow through, and take a look at the gauge. Okay, about 12 gallons, same as we got with the bucket. Another critical step at this stage is to create a detailed scale drawing of your yard, accurate to within a foot. You want to mark in your property lines, the street, your house, garage and driveway, as well as any decks, patios, walkways, trees, shrubs, or planting beds. All right. Okay, now comes the tricky part. Figuring out where to locate the sprinkler heads is the most mysterious part of the design process, and usually the hardest for the do-it-yourselfer to get up to speed on. First of all, you have to realize there are different heads to accomplish the job. There are the large ones, like these, that are designed to cover large areas. This type of head can usually spray water as far as 50 feet. It sends out a single stream, and it pivots around in a circle. You adjust how far back and forth the stream turns, anywhere from a full circle down to about an eighth of a circle. When you need a medium sized spray, something with about a 30 foot radius, you use a different type of head. In this product line, there's a head with fingers of spray that spin around. Another type of head, with a throw between about 6 and 15 feet, covers small areas. You'll often see lots of these types of heads grouped together to water odd shaped areas. And almost all the heads we'll use are pop up heads. When they're not in use, they sit flush with the ground. But when the water pressure comes on, the nozzle pops up a few inches. These sprinkler heads are designed to work best if they overlap. If you have a throw of 50 feet, you want to place the sprinkler heads 50 feet apart. In fact, if you want to get fancy about it, this is what they call head-to-head -head coverage. A general rule of thumb for figuring sprinkler head placement is to start in the corners of your areas. So we'll try putting one here in the corner. Then I use a compass to mark how far it'll throw, about 50 feet, which is 5 inches. And we'll make it spray in a quarter circle pattern, like this. Now let's try that in each corner of the area. Hmm. Well, we've got a 70 foot square area and a sprinkler that throws 50 feet. So we end up with very uneven coverage. We know we're going to need to put in more heads. The best way to do this is to adjust the heads so they only throw about halfway down each side. 
What that does is lets us put in a head in the middle of each side that sprays all the way into each corner. This head will be a half circle head. Still, the center of this area isn't going to get enough water. And the way to fix this is to put a head right in the middle of it. This is a full circle head. What we end up with is a pretty standard configuration for a large area. Quarter circle heads in the corners, half circle heads along the sides, and full circle heads in the middle. However, most areas won't be perfect squares. More often than not, the areas that you do work with will have irregular shapes. But even if you do start with a smaller skinny area like this one, you start the same way. Put a sprinkler head in each corner, spring a quarter circle, and use the largest head you can. Here, because the area is only 20 feet across, 20 feet is a maximum throw we can use. But these 20-foot heads don't spray far enough to reach down the long sides. So to solve this, we put some half-circle heads along the sides. Each head goes right at the point where the spray from the previous head dies out. This way we're sure that each spot is covered by the spray from two heads. Each sprinkler head uses a certain amount of water, measuring gallons per minute. So what you want to do is group all the sprinkler heads into circuits, making sure that no one circuit uses more water than the house can supply. And remember, our house flow rate is 12 gallons per minute. So, here in front, this small area uses six heads, drawing a total of 5.76 gallons. All of these can run at once, no problem. However, this other big area uses 12 heads, and together they would draw a total of 21 gallons per minute. So, we're better off dividing this area up into several circuits. Our aim is to draw no more than 6 to 7 gallons per minute on any one circuit. In other words, we don't want the sprinklers drawing all the water available to the house at any one point in time. Instead, we'd like to save some of the 12 gallons per minute for other uses in the home. All right. That's a good straight line there. All right, our next step is to transfer the design on our plan to the yard. And we're doing that using these little flags. Each flag represents a sprinkler head. All right. Got that? Okay, now the next one is right here in the center. Okay, I'm still at 22. You yep. want to stay there? Yep, that's the same distance. Okay. Now, once you've set your flags, you want to double check their measurement and placement. Well, for instance, we want to make sure that this full circle head is in the middle of the area it's supposed to be covering. Okay, we're getting a little bit of overspray in the neighbor's property. We should probably move it over a little. There's another really important preparation step you have to take before you start digging. Call your local utilities and have them come out and mark for any underground lines or wires. We're only going down a foot or so with our sprinkler pipes and heads, and the utilities are supposed to go deeper than this, but don't take any chances. Have them mark for everything. The phone, gas, power, water, everything you can think of. Now let's talk about tapping water mains to feed new sprinkler systems. At this home, the city water meter is buried in a box near the street. We dug down to the three-quarter inch service line running into the house. To maximize pressure, we tapped in here with a T-fitting to feed the sprinkler heads, after turning the water off, of course. We cut out a length of pipe size for the T and used compression fittings to secure it in place. Then we used PVC primer and glue to secure a shutoff valve for the system. Once it's joint set up, we turned the water back onto the house and shut the new valve off until we hooked up the sprinkler heads. You can also tap into an existing copper water line as we did in the basement at our other project. We cut into the service line beyond the water meter and teed off that to run a sprinkler line through the rim joist to the backyard. Now bear in mind, work like this may require the services of a licensed plumber, so be sure to check with your local building department. Right, you can hold that. We brought our water supply up and outside the house to a point higher than any of our sprinkler heads, and we do this because we have to install what's called a backflow preventer. Building codes almost everywhere require that you install some sort of device to protect the municipal water supply. After all, there are instances when floodwaters or an overflowing septic field could leak into the sprinkler system, and then the contaminated water could work its way back into the fresh water supply. There are a couple ways to prevent this. On this house, we'll be using a backflow preventer, or what's officially known as a pressure vacuum breaker. This prevents water from the sprinkler from flowing from the yard back into the house. We're going to run a little bit more copper down from the backflow preventer and into a hole in the ground. And we'll start making our sprinkler connections from this point. There are other ways of providing the required backflow prevention. We'll be doing another system on our first house. Here's another common arrangement for backflow prevention. These are called anti-siphon valves. And the valves themselves provide the backflow prevention, although they do it in a different way than a backflow preventer. Typically, these valves are installed above ground. We're running ours alongside the chimney here. 
and they're most often used with PVC pipe. The next big job was digging trenches to run all the new pipes, and we started in the yard where we used PVC. The trenches should be 2 to 4 inches wide and 8 to 10 inches deep. Hand digging is feasible, but it's a lot of work. So we strongly recommend renting a machine on virtually any lot large enough to require sprinklers. It'll get you through this phase so much more quickly that the rental's definitely worth it. Even before all the trenches are dug, we want to start putting in the pipe. After all, the sooner the sprinkler system is up and running, the sooner we can start spreading some grass seed, watering, and getting rid of these ugly lines of dirt. Now, there are different grades of PVC pipe. This is class 200 pipe, and we're using diameters that are 3 quarters of an inch and an inch, and all sorts of elbows, tees, adapters, fittings, and saddles. We recommend that you make all of your connections before you put your pipe in the ground. Now we're going to start here with the T connection. Water is going to come through here and then branch off to either side. So I need to start by cutting this pipe. There is a special pipe cutter that can be used to cut PVC, but most people end up using a hacksaw. Sawing leaves a lot of burrs on the cut ends, so you need to clean these off. Rubbing the end down with a rag should do the trick. Then we go through our standard steps for attaching PVC. Doesn't take long to glue all three legs of the T and move on to the next fitting. A sprinkler head is going to go at the end of this run here, so a combination elbow is the fitting that I need now. And I ran the pipe a little bit long, so now I can cut it right where I need it. Now when you work with PVC fittings, you might notice that the pieces tend to push apart a little before the joint hardens. That's because the inside of the fitting is tapered, so you need to hold the pieces together for a second till the glue takes hold. This PVC pipe comes in 20 foot lengths, so you need to connect them together if you've got a long run. Each pipe has a bell fitting at one end, so that makes this a little easier. The pipe is enlarged a little so that it'll slip over the other piece. So, once I've got my primer and my solvent on, I join the two pieces and then give them a little twist. Now you can see that our trench doesn't run in a perfect straight line, but that's okay because PVC pipe does have some flexibility. Now for the saddle connection that I'm making next, I don't have to cut the pipe. I can just put a little primer on top of the pipe where I want the fitting to end up. Now it's got to snap down over the top of the pipe. Now this doesn't have an opening in it yet for the water. We'll have to come back later and drill it out. As water travels farther out into the yard through the pipes, it tends to lose its pressure a little bit. So if your pressure is marginal to begin with, you may want to think about increasing your pipe size as you head back toward the water source. And that way, the very last head on the run will be sure to have enough water pressure to operate. Now that's what we're doing here. We've got our three-quarter inch pipe toward the end of the run where we've started to make our connections. And we're going to move into one inch pipe as we head back toward the house. And the way to make this transition is with a one inch tee with a reducing bushing. This bushing fits into one side of the tee so that it'll fit a three-quarter inch pipe. So our one inch pipe attaches to one side of the tee and our three-quarter inch pipe travels out to where we've already been working. PVC pipe will bend a little, but sometimes it's best to build in a turn. You're pretty much limited to 45 degree angle turns or 90 degree angle turns. Well, for instance here, we're using this 45 degree elbow to make the transition turn up here. Once the run's been completed all the way back to the water source, we can set the pipe in the trench. There we go. We've just been holding it in place over the trenches with these short scraps of PVC. 
Okay, I put together what's called a valve manifold. It runs water from our point of connection out to the individual circuits through our control valves. Now I'll set this in this hole over here, like so, and you notice that the control valves stick a little bit out above grade. At the bottom of the manifold, we have one inch T-fittings with short pieces of pipe between them. Now we cut these connecting pipes long enough so that if we ever have to replace one of these valves, we've got enough room to be able to spin it around and unscrew it. Now, the first connection I'm making here to the manifold is the water supply line that feeds water into all the valves. And next, I'm connecting the pipe that feeds out to our first backyard circuit. Before you install any sprinkler heads, you should flush the lines first. Dirt might have gotten inside the lines or the pipe filings from the drilling and the cutting. And these little particles can clog the nozzles in the sprinkler heads and really mess things up. So we're going to run a little water through the lines first. To flush the lines effectively, we've got these little pipe caps to stop up all the fittings in the line except the last ones. For this circuit, I've left the elbow at the end of each branch open. Now we can start the water. Now I've already turned on the main valve at the point of connection. Now we can open the control valve for this circuit. Okay, Dean, go ahead. Okay, here it goes. Now we'll just let the water run out of these fittings that are on the end. Whoops, here we go. Now this can get a little bit messy, but you really should let this water run for at least a minute or two. The trench will probably fill up with water, but this really is a necessary step. Okay, that's good. You can turn it off. All right. Now one thing that might surprise you when you operate these electric control valves the first time, it takes a while for the valve to completely close. So if you have to operate these manually, plan on a little bit more water coming out than you might think. Now right away, we're going to attach the sprinkler heads for this circuit so no more dirt can get inside the pipes. And there are two basic techniques for attaching the heads. Here, we're using a cutoff riser. This is a piece of soft polyethylene plastic that's threaded at both ends. You screw one end down into the fitting on the pipe, and the sprinkler head screws onto the riser. If your trench is at the right depth, your sprinkler head will start off about two or three inches above ground level. And that gives you some room to work with. However, you want the head to be right at ground level so the grass can grow a little higher around it. So we need to take off about two inches here. So I unscrew the riser. Then I use this special cutter for polyethylene pipe to trim about two inches off the bottom. You squeeze it gently and twist it around the riser. And you get a real clean cut. Then I screw all this back down into the elbow, and that should do it. Another way to attach your head to your fitting is to use flexible polyethylene pipe. This manufacturer calls it funny pipe, evidently because you can do a lot of different things with it. You use the poly cutters or even garden shears to cut a piece about 18 inches long. Then you screw one of these little barb connectors onto the bottom of the head. And then I take off the riser and the cap and screw another connector onto the T-fitting. Now I jam the funny pipe over the end of the fitting and with a little bit of up and down motion like this, you can usually get it on fairly easy. Now these fittings have little barbs, and these hold the pipe in place and make a watertight seal. Now when you make your connections using funny pipe, you set the head at the exact height when you fill the dirt in the trench. Now some contractors will use funny pipe to make all their connections, and it does have its advantages. For instance, if your threaded fitting isn't perfectly straight up and down, the funny pipe can help out by twisting the head slightly till it's perfectly vertical before you fill the trench in. It also acts as a bit of a shock absorber. If you drive a lawnmower over the top of it, there's a little bit of give. Is it on yet? Yeah, it's on. It just takes a second. What we're looking for at this point are any leaks or bad connections. You know, if you haven't glued much PVC or worked with funny pipe before, this is your last chance to make sure that all the connections are watertight. And this one looks pretty good. Now, none of the heads are adjusted properly. 
and they may flop around a little bit so it won't be real pretty. But the important thing is, is we're able to double check the connections here before we fill in the trenches. Okay, turn it off, Joanne. Once you've tested the circuits and everything's looking good, you can go ahead and fill the trenches back in flush with the surface. Be sure to compact the soil really well to prevent any settling. And make sure each sprinkler head is free of dirt. Now the last step on this circuit is to adjust the head so that the water sprays where it's supposed to. Now on this head, it's supposed to spray in a quarter circle pattern from here to here. With different heads, you make the adjustments different ways. Sometimes you just turn the whole head to get it to spray in the right direction. For other adjustments, you have to release a locking screw. Then we can change the arc from a half circle to a quarter circle. With this sprinkler head, we can adjust how far it sprays. Now remember, we want the spray from each head to reach over to the next head in the same area. This way we maintain our head-to-head -head coverage. If I turn this screw down a little, that shortens the throw. Well, I'm going to get this last one adjusted. Okay, I'll be up by the valve box. All right. On our other project, we use polyethylene pipe, which can actually be laid out with a machine like this. It's called a vibratory plow. The pipe is pulled behind a blade that digs into the lawn and sets it at just the right depth. The ends of the pipe are left above ground at each joint and sprinkler head, but the rest remains buried. Now, this is more of a professional job, so we hired a crew to do this yard. They can make all the runs fairly quickly without disturbing the lawn much at all. Keep your shovel handy, though, because you do have to dig up the grass and soil at the joints and sprinkler heads to make the connections. When they pulled the pipe out of the ground, they left a little bit extra. So now I need to figure out where to cut it. I use this special cutter to trim it. Just squeeze it and turn it a bit. And the handle of the cutter is shaped so that I can stick it into the cut end of the pipe and stretch it out a little. This makes it easier to put on the fitting. Then I slip two of these little metal hose clamps over the end. A sprinkler head will go here, coming out of an elbow. And this works the same as an elbow in a PVC system, except when you're working with poly, you don't use any glue to attach it to the pipe. The ridge side of the elbow goes into the end of the pipe. This isn't always the easiest thing to do. Sometimes you've got to use a rubber mallet to persuade it a little. Then I use the metal clamps to secure the elbow. There's a special tool, kind of looks like a wire cutter, that you use to squeeze the clamps tight. I want to make sure that the two clamps both tighten down over the ridged section of the elbow. From here on in, it's just standard operating procedure. We'll cut the riser off so that the sprinkler head will sit at the right height, screw it in, and move on to the next one. The T-connectors for polyethylene pipe have these ridge inserts on all three legs. First, I have to take a section out of one pipe to make room for the T-fitting. And sometimes you forget to put the clamps on. Always put those on before you put the fitting in. Now, here's the part that takes a little muscle. I try to bend the first piece a little to give me room to slip over the other end. Okay, now I cut the last piece to length. Slip on the pipe clamps and work it into the third connector on the T. And I like to wait until all three of the pipes are connected to the T before I tighten any of the clamps. With polyethylene pipe, there's a special trick you can do when you have to make a saddle connection, like we've got to do here. You don't have to cut the pipe open. What you do is clamp this saddle around the pipe and tighten it down with a nut driver. Then you take this little hole cutter and push it down into the center of the saddle. Twist it around once or twice and pull it out. And there you can see there's a little circle of polyethylene on the end of the cutter. Now I just screw the riser and the head on to complete the job. And those are the three basic types of connections that you make with poly pipe. Just like there are different types of pipes for different parts of the country, there are also different methods for installing the control valves. 
In colder climates, where polypipe is more frequently used, you'll find that people tend to use valves that can be recessed in boxes in the ground. Here, we've put three valves together to form what's called a valve manifold. The water comes in here, and it goes to each valve, and that controls which circuit gets water. Water is also going to flow out here, and it'll go to other valve boxes in different parts of the yard. Now, we still have to get from our copper pipes down to our control valves, and here's how we'll do this. Take a short piece of polyethylene pipe and put it on the end of our connector here, like so. Kind of have to muscle it in place. And here, we're using all stainless steel worm gear hose clamps. We want the extra security that these give us for all our connections at the valve box. To make our connections here in the bottom of the copper pipe, we have a brass threaded female adapter a plastic nail adapter over the top of which we put our polyethylene pipe and we tighten the whole thing down with a hose clamp. There we go. Finally, we connect the pipe to complete our first circuit. And after testing it, we can finish the rest using the same techniques. But right now, let's move back to our first project to talk about automating a sprinkler system. Yep, just about. All right, well, I'll be in the garage. Okay, I'll be up in just a minute. Now some people are happy with a system that gives them nothing more than we've got here. We've eliminated all the hose and sprinklers used in the yard. There are just a couple of knobs to turn on. But by stopping at this point, you miss one of the main advantages you can have in a system like this, and that's automatic controls. These are electric valves. They can be turned off and on with an electronic controller. Now to get this all set up, we'll run wires between the electric valves and the controller. Now our sprinkler order came with some six conductor wire. We can hook up five valves with this. One conductor, this white one, will be a common lead to all the valves. And then the other five wires will each go to an individual valve. With this type of valve, you just shove the wire into a little slot in the handle. And this is what makes the electrical connection. Now I put a common white lead into one terminal, and I take one of the color leads, and I put that into another terminal on the valve. Then I take a little extra piece of wire here, and run a white common from the other terminal here on the valve to the next valve over. But before I do that, I place a cap on the top here. This covers the connections and keeps them from accidentally pulling out. All right, well that takes care of wiring the valves. Now you'll notice that each valve has a common wire running to it and a colored lead. Now it's a good idea to leave a little extra wire in case you want to turn the valves off or on. So what we've done is just coiled up a little bit of wire on each one of the leads. And the cable runs through a hole into the garage. The wires travel over and up to the controller, which I've mounted on the wall here, right next to an electrical outlet. Now, inside the controller, there's a common screw on the terminal strip. And both of our white wires are attached here. There. Okay, now it's tough to keep track of which wires for which circuit. So there's this special terminal here on the strip to test each wire. I pick a wire and hold it onto it. This terminal is always hot, so whatever circuit this wire is connected to should be running right now. Hey, Dean, is anything going on right now? Yeah, let's see. The circuit here along the driveway and the street's on. Okay. Now let's see. All right, now we wanted that to be circuit number four. So, we'll just take this wire and attach it to the number four terminal. What a controller does is allows you to water your yard very effectively and efficiently. Well, for one thing, you... Joanne, that's a circuit in the center of the yard. Okay. For one thing, you're able to control the amount of water that goes to any one section of the yard. For instance, if you have an area of the yard that gets a lot of wind and sun, you can put a little extra water on it. Okay, that's a circuit along the lot line. Got it. Another thing you can do is water early in the morning, like 3 or 4 o'clock. One good reason is the sprinklers aren't competing with other uses for water, like a shower or a dishwasher. And another good reason is any water that's left on the grass will be evaporated by the morning sun. You don't want to have water standing on the blades. It just promotes turf diseases. So that's why watering in the evening isn't a good idea. All right, Joe, this is a circuit of small heads on the east side of the house. Well, there we go. Sophisticated electronic controllers like this one give you a whole lot of flexibility in watering your yard. Well, setting one up is kind of like programming your VCR. First, you have to set its internal clock, which I've just done. 
Now I'm going to tell it which day of the week I want it to water. Let's see, we want it for Monday, Wednesday, Friday, and Saturday. You can also program it to run every day, every other day, every third, fourth, fifth day, regardless of which day of the week it is. Now I want to tell it what time I want the system to turn on. So I move this little pointer over here, and it shows up in the display what time the system will turn on. Actually, 3 a.m. is perfect. Now I want to tell each circuit how long it should run. And our sprinkler parts dealer gave us some general guidelines for this. Basically, you want the larger circuits, which would be 2 and 3, to run for about 45 minutes. And the medium size heads for about 20 minutes. And number 7. And the smallest heads to go about 10 minutes. There. Okay, now if I've programmed this correctly, the system will turn on Mondays, Wednesdays, Fridays, and Saturdays at 3 in the morning. It'll start with circuit 1, which will go for 40 minutes, move on to circuit 2 for 45, and all the way through the rest of the circuits until it finally turns itself off. But we want to see the system run right now, just to check it out. So, I'll press this button right here. Well, we hope you've learned something about the installation of sprinkler systems from this videotape. Remember, there's a lot of options and variables when it comes to designing and installing sprinkler systems. I'm Dean Johnson. And I'm Joanne Liebler. Thanks for watching.